I'm going to get started so we don't waste any time, but I'm sure people will be rolling in like always. So we have eagerly been awaiting our last workshop speaker for today, um, uh, Professor Susan Oman from the University of Sheffield. Again, we've been so excited for your talk. So um, very happy to have you here in our workshop series. And Professor Oman is a lecturer in data, AI and society at the University of Sheffield. And today she will be talking about her most recent monograph, Understanding Well-Being Data, Improving Social and Cultural Policy Practice and Research. So all of us, again, have really been watching your work and seeing this new book come on the horizon. So I'm excited to hear you speak about it today. So just like always, um, please put your questions into the chat. Uh, and if you have a burning question, you can feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, we usually take questions near the end of the workshop and I will make sure to call on everybody. So with that, I will turn it over to Susan. Well, thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you for um, such a, a grand entrance and uh, thanks for having me and waiting for me. Sorry, I couldn't come in the autumn. Um, so yes, I will be discussing my book, Understanding Wellbeing Data, um, talking about the need to understand well-being data as a cultural problem. Um, so for thousands of years, philosophers have asked what makes for a good society or indeed the good life. You know, ideas of culture and the cultural are fundamental to these theories of how we experience well-being, what it even is, whether that's personal well-being, social well-being and so on. But also ideas of well-being are a cultural product. They're a product of different cultures and different times and places. Different people at different times have different ideas about what being well-being is and what well-being is for. And for Jeremy Bentham, you know, for him, happiness became a, a, a way of doing policy. And he argued that it's the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. And subsequent to Jeremy Bentham, in fact, only kind of 15 years ago, his work regained popularity. And um, in the UK, we have a happiness czar called Richard Layard. And he argues that in fact, much of social progress that's occurred since Bentham has been driven by Jeremy Bentham's greatest happiness people. So ideas of well-being and what they're for, what they do and their relationship to data are very historically contingent. And so this, presentation reflects on some of the key arguments from my book, including the role or the roles of data in understanding well-being and culture. Oops, sorry. Um, so we're going to, the book does two things basically, it's a book of two halves and the first half establishes well-being data. It, their origins, whether that's in terms of policy or technological context and so on, as well as how they're constructed, their social effects, you know, we look at um, the origins of particular questions that help establish ideas of well-being, as well as how they're measured and how those measurements kind of move through time. Um, the second half of the book primarily argues that cultural policy began through the idea that culture has an inherent relationship to well-being that I call the culture well-being relationship. Um, and so what we're going to do in reviewing data and well-being as cultural products, I argue, this enables us to help, this enables us to understand how data works in our cultural understandings of well-being and their relationship to culture as the arts. Okay, so I'm also going to spend some time discussing my approach, which I call following the data. Um, that emerges from my background in art history and cultural studies but that I bring to critical data studies and critical policy studies that focuses on culture. So yeah, today we're gonna to spend some time following the data, which is a familiar phrase by those blighted by coverage of UK politicians handling the recent COVID-19 to justify policy actions. So we're gonna follow the data backwards to historicize wellbeing data and the cultural well-being relationship briefly and this allows us to review the role of data and culture and how they've evolved together. Oops. Okay so then what is well-being data? Well well-being data can be anything that's about the well-being of people and populations and in fact goes back thousands of years to the Sumerians using clay tablets 
um, as well as the Roman census that of course you see here. However, what you think of when you think of well-being data might be statistics, and you'd be right, the modern term statistics was in fact coined with the invention of a new system of accounting for national governance. Um, and this was to ascertain the quantum of happiness with a view to using these data to govern the nation better. This, govern, um, this nation being Scotland rather than England, everyone tends to assume it's England, the Scottish don't like that. So these kind of population data kind of grew in sophistication and prevalence throughout the 19th century. And here you can see on this um, image that I might may have borrowed from the internet, someone has very carefully labeled in blue biro that this is the census from 1891. But the census kind of started to evolve in the UK in the mid 19th century um, and revealed the increasing momentum for governments to understand their populations better whether that's understanding births or deaths or unemployment rates or indeed how people moved around to control resources. Now, what we see after the Second World War is a kind of an, a more of an international way of dealing with well-being data. And with the increasing momentum to share information on populations, um, this led to the International Statistical Commission in 1947. And with these new institutions of international organizing came recognitions that statistics for well-being required better data, more detailed data, de data that helped us understand what people thrive. But of course, well-being data today in the first quarter of the 21st century, only just, which is a really painful thing to say, means something quite different. And of course, with the invention of things like Fitbits, well-being isn't just about governments counting where people are and what resources to attribute to them. It's far more sophisticated than that. Instead, the idea is, of course, that we control our own well-being and our own well-being data, as long as we're prepared to share it with private companies. <laughs> um, so what's interesting, I suppose, is a, a promise for cultural policy using these well-being data is in theory, these big data from social media and mobile tracking devices allow us to understand more about how people feel and what they are doing in an exact time and place. However, much of the well-being data that I encounter indicate that many disciplines and really people in their everyday lives aren't necessarily that interested in health data and certainly not so interested in administrative data. Um, and in the early 2010, subjective well-being questions began appearing in more and more national and international surveys. Now, the idea of measuring how someone feels about their well-being isn't completely new. It's been with us 50 years. But what we see is this becoming more of a blanket approach to surveys, to social surveys. So these questions aren't uh, proxy questions, they're not about objective data, they don't necessarily want to know about the quality of an environment using a particular data point, they want to understand how we feel in and of ourselves that might enable some analysis of how particular policy interventions might affect how people feel in a particular area over another. So if you like, this is starting to feel a bit more like the idea of well-being that we started with, right? Like how we live together or indeed the good life, the nature of happiness, how we experience contemplation, feel empathy and escape the bits of our lives that we don't enjoy or that are painful. And all of these features of well-being have been argued as having an inherent relationship to culture. Um, and if we historicize this idea, particularly borrowing the way that Belfiore and Bennett uh, historicize it in The Social Impact of the Arts, they argue that this has long been theorized um, and that there's this clear lineage between from Plato and Aristotle, who you can see arguing in Athens right here, through Kant, who argued about, um, who uh, philosophized about what subjective experience was when it came to engaging with the arts or nature and our well-being, or indeed Schopenhauer, who argued that the arts were perfect for escaping from the cruel realities of everyday life. So if you like all of these qualities and their interactions with culture, when we interact with culture, um, are both 
aspects of well-being, but have also been theorized throughout town as being throughout time as being unique or inherent qualities of interacting with culture. And I argue that this has happened for so long, over so many hundreds, of, if not thousands of years, that not only are we looking at how this has been theorized, but we need to be thinking about how and why it's been naturalized. Like, why is it common sense that culture is good for well-being? Now, in the last couple of hundred years, we've seen an increasing number of institutions established to solve social problems and civilize the working man by building buildings to give him somewhere to go that isn't the pub. Instead, he'll be, you know, enraptured by a Raphael in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and so this in turn sees these institutions for culture, um, not only institutionalizing this idea of the culture well-being relationship, but instrumentalizing it. So bringing, you know, having instrumentally applying it to society, believing that it will, it will have some kind of social impact. And of course, in the last 50 to 100 years, again, just after the Second World War, this institutionalization evolves beyond buildings with art councils and national funding structures established. And this is where the idea of the culture well-being relationship has become operationalized increasingly to do the work of social policy. So the last four decades or so um, see, has seen this increasing argument that the arts are instrumental to social policy aims. So not only like, oh, probably the arts are good for well-being, but you know, health policy cannot be delivered as well without some kind of arts program are some of the arguments that you see. However, people who make these arguments don't always reflect on the limits of these claims who they serve and indeed who they do not. So now instrumentalizing this idea that the arts are, sorry, operationalizing the idea that the arts are instrumental to well-being, this has come with this burden of proof where if the relationship is true and causal, then of course we need to prove it, but how? Enter the role of the new well-being data, specifically the subjective well-being data and the role of a new wave of metrics and a new way of modeling them. So the cultural sector doesn't necessarily have the skills within it to utilize these data in the way that it might like, or indeed, as actually I found in my research often, it doesn't necessarily understand what's going on in either the data or the models. Um, so in advocating for the uses of these new data, to make more complex arguments, a whole new wave of experts were able to create an industry of metrics for the cultural sector. So then, as the cultural wellbeing relationship has been theorized, institutionalized, metricized and capitalized, this has a direct relationship to the evolution of data as one that simply, moving from one that simply described the world until it was institutionalized in the National Statistics Commission, for example, to intervene in the world and it has now become um, you know financialized and increasingly complex as of course it, it has our well-being with the well-being industry <clears throat> so then you may have heard the phrase that data is the new oil i just want to reflect on this for a moment because it isn't is it when you when you kind of put things into context in the way we just have data has in fact oil thousands of years of progress and exploitation, where well-being is understood in material terms, whether that's financial, food, truths, and so on. In some ways, I want to argue that this is the role of critical data studies, to establish the possibilities and the effects of data before they get out of control. Yet critical data studies tends to focus on these big, sexy new data that um, we're, you know, it's called exhaust data. We're giving it off all the time. We're not conscious of it. Whereas the subjective well-being data and the metrics primarily used by the um, CCIs at the moment, uh, that's data that's given willingly. It's people answering questions in surveys in quite a mundane traditional method. So it's kind of stuck between the two. And the other thing is with critical data studies, a lot of the time it catastrophizes data, like, oh my goodness, it's gonna take over, you know, AI, robots, and so on. But actually, when you look at the way that big data has been operationalized, especially to answer questions of relevance to cultural policy, even if it's not in cultural policy research, then really the problems are that it pants rather than it's all seeing and all powerful. <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> the starting point for my research questions, or to be honest, indeed, most of my everyday life, is why doesn't this work? And so I think in some ways, this is an application of a methodology that tries to look at how the building blocks of research for culture, uh, the evidence problem and data just aren't really working to serve the cultural sector very well, or indeed the evidence base. And so I try and follow the data around to see how it's working and oiling the machines of cultural policy. Now, as I've already said, following the data is a familiar phrase for those blighted by coverage of UK politicians handling COVID-19. The phrase more specifically is used to justify policy actions to manage COVID-19, both in a knee-jerk way. So at the beginning, it was like, we have to go into lockdown. I can say this because we're following the data. And then it was like, oh, we have to come out of lockdown. I can say this because we're following the data. Whereas actually what you're seeing is um, an increasing amount of the phrase talking about like social policy aims with a longer tail, whether that's housing or health or education and so on. So following the data as a critical research practice long precedes COVID experts, sorry, not following the data, following the X as a critical practice. And so two of the most influential researchers on my work, I suddenly realized when finishing the book, had used this phrase following the something to describe the critical work they were doing. So Zara Ahmed is a cultural theorist, critical race theorist, and she wrote a book called The Promise of Happiness. And she describes this kind of Foucauldian archeology span that she does of the word happiness as following the word happiness around. So she follows it into media and cultural products and finds cultural tropes of the happy slave or the happy housewife and describes kind of how these cultural tropes limit the forms of happiness that certain people get to have. Tim Mitchell is an anthropologist and an economist and his work has followed the work of economics around to international contexts. So he's done this historically with Egypt uh, in the 19th century, and he's looked at not only economic practices, but practices of mapping, even museology, actually changed the shape of Egypt in the 19th century. But he's also in, done so in contemporary developing contexts and found that particular forms of economics have changed the economic practices and increased inequality in these localized developing contexts. But critically, when it comes to doing this as a research practice, this enables us to understand how um, aspects of culture or um, particular social practices, the work that they do in particular social contexts and who suffers and who wins as a result of them. So I follow the data quite a lot in the book, um, whether that's looking at the origins of the questions that generate particular wellbeing data, looking at how questions have changed over time and the research that trialed them, finding limitations and some of the claims made. Um, but there's one whole chapter, which is an in-depth study on um, a report called Museum and Happiness that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, there's other case studies that look at, that follow different kinds of data and how different people have used it to understand how people access culture and the relationship of that to wellbeing cultural labour and well-being, and in the UK, the big obsession, which is using arguments for well-being to ask for more funding from central government. So <clears throat> the main reason, the main argument, especially in the UK, for arguing for funding from um, centralised bodies, whether that's the government directly or non-departmental government bodies, is this idea of cultural value. So arguably, there are two main strands of cultural value. Well-being value, it's good for society and people, or economic value, it increases the economic returns on investments year on year. So what you see with the new uses of the subjective well-being data is that these two well these two values, well-being value and economic value, can be reconciled by new versions of econometrics and then translated back into discourse, like the positive messages about the values of culture find their way back into reports to policy and media representations. So the, basically the, the, the key argument here is like, look, if culture makes you happier and culture makes you money, 
then how much money makes you as happy as a given unit of culture? So one example of this that's really clear in terms of some of the stuff that's going on is this newspaper headline from 2014 from a large scale, from a really well-read broadsheet at the posher end uh, of newsprint media in 2014. And the argument in the headline is dancing makes happy people as happy as a 1600 pound pay rise. And then the subheading is official figures reveal for the first time how culture and sport make people as happy as being given pay rises worth thousands of pounds. So already, you know, no matter whether you agree or believe with the headline, you can already see this leap from 1600 to pay rises worth thousands of pounds because we're really trying to squeeze the, the exaggeration out of the situation. So what happens if you follow these numbers back back to the reports from which they originated. Well, you can see um, some, these are the headline findings here, um, and you can see there's no mention of dancing at all. In fact, the report was written for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, as it was called at the time, through, um, I should say. Uh, in this report, there's estimates for many different activities, but to towards the end of the report, on page 29, the authors expressed the finding that, participation in dance has the highest value of £1,671 per annum, followed by swimming and library visits. So the finding about dance appears in this form only twice in this report, once in a regression table, but let's face it, the journalist's not going to have read, and then the second time is underneath the regression table, about two thirds of the way through this report on page 29. In other words, it's far from a headline finding. So despite the lack of prominence of this monetary estimate in the original report, it finds itself at the beginning of a journey which results in a national newspaper headline like this one. So what I'm trying to argue is there's clearly a cultural difference between not only these monetary estimates might mean, what they might be trying to value, what they might be trying to represent, but also which ones are of interest and to whom. The fact that this national newspaper could print a picture from the nation's favourite TV show at the time is probably more of a driver for the headline than the econometric modelling, don't tell the modellers. But the point is, is that following data like this intermedia discourse can present us with some interesting results. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with a little vignette. This equation appeared on um, my presentation slides when I was giving my first major conference presentation of my PhD. So there I was, I'd got funding to sit in a Manchester hotel, frantically prepping slides, thinking it was all going to be awful and something awful was going to happen and I was going to fall off stage and all of the rest of it. And someone peers over my shoulder and is like, oh, what's that? And I thought, ah, but you're a quants guy, surely you know what this means because it's an equation and therefore it's got a really explicit objective meaning. And he was like, nope, means nothing to me. So I then explained, OK, well, this equation actually is supposed to express the relationship between museums and happiness, as far as I understood it. And he was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> um, and so we both came away thinking, what's going on with this equation? Like, what's it for? What's it doing? Who understands it? And what, what meaning does it has, have? And so we ended up spending quite a few years following this equation around basically like weirdos uh, in different ways. So the equation comes from a report um, called Museums and Happiness, the value of participating in museums and the arts. And the Happy Museum project uh, emerged kind of 2011-ish and actually was the inspiration for me starting an MA project looking at the relationship between culture and happiness. So it's the beginning of my journey anyway. Um, but this quote from Tony Butler, a really nice guy and director of the Happy Museum Project says, the aim of this report slash project is to arm museums with compelling statistics to show how a healthy culture must be at the heart of a healthy society. So already we kind of know that this is not a, an, a, an attempt to like really neutrally gauge like the, the relationship between museums and happiness to really change the the nature of evidence. It's got a really clear agenda. And while that agenda is a good one for many of us in the room, I'm sure, um, it, it probably doesn't help in terms of thinking about the evidence-based culture. 
How can we follow the data in different ways to help build a better picture of what's going on? This is a description of what the researcher is researching when he's measuring happiness. So he argues happiness taps into people's emotions, technically their affective state, and hence tries to gauge people's moods at that moment. But when you look at the data point that um, is used from the taking part survey, again, from the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, as it was called at the time, uh, the question that, um, that basically generates these data asks, taking all things together, how happy would you say you are? Sorry, helps if I finish the question. So basically the point of this question is, this is an overall general happiness question. So the point of this question is not to get at uh, tapping into people's emotions in that moment, but to ask them about how they feel, how happy they feel they are with their life or their lot overall. So already you can see a slight discrepancy in what's being measured according to um, what happiness is claimed to do here in the equation, but also the limits to what can be gathered with data, using data from this question. Now, when it comes to the questions that derive the museum's data, they ask questions like, during the last 12 months, have you attended a museum or gallery at least once? So going back to this idea of happiness being all about being in the moment, I just want you to kind of take a moment to think, okay, so you've got some, some guy or woman with a clipboard or whatever has gone round to someone's kitchen and they're like trying to prep tea for their kids and they're asked, being asked a series of questions about cultural participation and then how they feel about their life overall. None of these questions are going to allow people to be kind of communicating how they felt in the museum at that moment and how that made them happy. So while that doesn't mean there isn't a relationship between people going to the museum once a year and having overall happiness, what's important is the way that it's described and conveyed. So when it comes to the findings, and this is how the findings were presented with a series of ticks rather than bullet points, um, you can see that people value visiting museums at about £3,200 per year. So that's twice as much as dancing, but this research was done before the dancing rather than after, because I'm presenting it after. Okay, so after the, the valuations, there's a caveat saying the well-being valuation techniques used here are in line with welfare economic theory on valuation, but we should note that these values should not be seen as amounts that people would actually be willing to pay per year for these activities. And so the difficulty is, in the sentence construction, people value music, visiting museums at about £3,200 per year. For the cultural sector who want to be armed with the st statistics to advocate for investment, ongoing investment or increased investment in culture, they will think that people literally you and I value museums at this amount per year. They won't be able to divorce that from any, any sense of like this being amounts that people would actually be willing to pay or not, depending on your valuation technique. What also happens next when you follow this into the media discourse is you see the headline report finds visiting museums boosts happiness. So what you can see is the exaggeration of like, oh, there's some valuations where we've used this data and used this data and this technique, and there's probably a, value, a monetary estimate of sorts to people value it at this, to report finds visiting museums boosts happiness. Now, what did we find when we followed the findings? Well, so when we replicated the findings, I say we, I didn't replicate the findings, Mark did that. <laughs> um, I did all the other following around. Uh, we found the estimations too high. This may not surprise you, but I just want to point out that it's not like, oh, we were right and they were wrong. There's a whole base of, um, bunch of stuff that could be going on. You know, we could have coded the variables differently, but also like the modeling could be slightly off, even though we followed how it was described. And of course, all data practices aren't neutral. They're all biased, even when they try to be. So, what we see around the early 2010s is this increasing number of examples of research commissioned to advocate for the value of the arts and culture. And these mainly use the newer subjective well-being data introduced at the time. However, in the second half of the 2010s, 
we also see this kind of developing use of big data as data from wearable tech and sensors and social media data and so on to try and grasp more about how people feel or what they are doing with greater accuracy. Now, if truth be told, both of these endeavors are often exploratory and exploratory research using exploratory data modeling is fine, I'm not against that at all. What, what I'm trying to get at is that the gap in the languages and the practices between those who are used to working with data and those who aren't means that all of the nuance of this research is lost. And so if you follow the, the kind of critical data study stuff around AI and um, machine learning, it's all concerned with how human biases have made their way into data and modeling and so on. But we don't just need to remove biases from the modeling and the data practices, because, of course, if we believe in the cultural well-being relationship, we're just going to keep finding it. You know, like our biases are always going to uh, affect what, whatever is researched. So I've tried to explain how following the data in the book means that we can recognize this intertwined history of well-being data and the management of populations and the management of culture but also that data and ideas of well-being are cultural products that affect the production of policy, culture and media representations. But also that we need to address the biases that limit how we can better understand and manage culture and well-being. So essentially, I want to argue, understanding well-being data is a cultural problem. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you my website that the book is now available on um, so the, or where there's an individual URL for all the different subsections of all the chapters and explanatory boxes like this is what validity means they all have individual URLs to help with teaching and so on um, as well as clips as well as the animations that you saw some clips of in the presentation but I will stop talking now and um, thank you very much I look forward to your questions <laughs>